my first question is for you, Gaston. After studying in France and beginning your career in Burkina, you began teaching cinema at In Effect. Fast forward 35 years, where you have now founded and run the Imagine Institute for the past 17 years. Please tell us about the role and ambition for Imagine in cinema on the continent today and how the nurturing of your film talent has changed, um, expanded on the continent in your view. Alors, c'est assez simple. Euh, comme euh, la modératrice l'a dit, euh, j'ai dirigé la Fédération panafricaine des cinéastes euh, pendant 12 ans et au cours de ces 12 ans, j'ai constaté que la question de la formation des professionnels était réellement cruciale, euh, que cette question était centrale par rapport au devenir même du cinéma africain. Donc, je me suis battu pour euh, que des étudiants aillent dans des écoles de formation à l'extérieur de l'Afrique, comme à l'école de San Antonio de Los Baños ou à la FEMIS, euh, et aussi à l'intérieur de l'Afrique pour que des étudiants aillent au NAFTI, le National Film and Television Institute à Accra, au Ghana. Voilà, donc, et j'ai été donné des cours de formation dans plein de pays en Afrique, à la fois francophone et anglophone. Voilà, et donc quand j'ai quitté la fédération en tant que premier responsable, je me suis, en 1997, je me suis posé la question, que puis-je faire pour poursuivre le travail que j'avais fait à la tête de de notre organisation professionnelle continentale. Et il m'est apparu que peut-être l'une des choses à faire en premier lieu, c'était d'actionner d'une manière tout à fait modeste et humble euh, voilà, le, le gros dossier de la formation. Et voilà comment l'idée d'Imagine est née. Donc, Imagine est née comme un lieu de formation à la fois théorique et pratique pour des, des débutants, mais aussi des professionnels qui sont en demande de formation, de perfectionnement, je veux dire, qui sont en demande de perfectionnement. Et aussi, l'idée était que l'Institut Imagine soit un lieu de fermentation, de la réflexion sur tous les enjeux du cinéma africain. So it's quite simple. As the moderator said, um, I directed the Pan-African Filmmakers Federation for 12 years. And during that time, I noticed that the question of training for filmmakers was crucial and, and central in the, I, in the development of African film, the becoming of African film. And so I put a good deal of energy into fighting for students to be able to get that training by going to schools outside Africa, such as the FEMIS in Paris or the San Antonio School, and also on the continent, um, for instance, at the National Film School in Accra, in Ghana. And during that period, I went and gave training courses myself in many, many countries in Africa, both in English speaking and French speaking Africa. When I left the Federation in 1997, having been its head for a long time, I asked myself, what are the conditions that we need to put in place to continue the work that was done through the Federation? And the first thing that appeared clearly to me was that we needed to put in place in a, in a modest and humble way, something that would tackle the question of training, of education for filmmakers. And that's how Imagine, my institute came to be born. It was imagined as a place um, where both theoretical and practical training could happen, both for beginners and professionals who wanted to improve their skills. And there was also this idea that the Institute would be a place that would really find 
and exist as a place for fermentation, a, a cauldron for what was really at stake in African cinema. Thank you very much. Euh, et donc, euh, et donc, euh, euh, l'école est née euh, et nous avons commencé à recevoir des étudiants euh, à travers toute l'Afrique parce que je voulais que ça soit euh, un lieu euh, où il y aurait la plus grande, euh, le plus grand brassage possible euh, de, de stagiaires avec des expériences diverses vivant dans des réalités diverses. So the school was born and we started to receive students from all over Africa. It was a place that I wanted to have the greatest mix possible of students with different experiences and coming from different backgrounds. Et donc nous avons reçu des stagiaires au total de 27 pays. Voilà, dont parmi lesquels je peux nommer l'Éthiopie, euh, la Zambie, euh, le Zimbabwe, euh, le Nigeria, euh, le Ghana euh, et bien sûr euh, l'immense majorité des pays francophones. Voilà, au total 27 pays et nous avons formé euh, au cours des années jusqu'à aujourd'hui 2436 euh, différents stagiaires. C'est pas forcément, il y a des stagiaires qui sont venus deux, trois fois parce qu'ils avaient besoin de continuer d'augmenter euh, euh, leurs compétences et, et leurs pratiques sur le terrain. Parce que l'idée était d'offrir à l'Afrique pas seulement des réalisateurs, mais aussi des techniciens qui sont en même temps des créateurs pour que l'Afrique puisse mettre en place sa propre vision du cinéma, de l'esthétique de l'image, etc., etc. So the we to date have received uh, students, or we call them interns, from 27 countries, of which I can mention Ethiopia, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, Ghana, and of course, vastly the majority of French speaking countries. So a total of 27 countries with to date 2,436 interns trained at Imagine, some of whom have come two or three times because they needed to improve their skills or get more on the job training. The idea here was to provide Africa not only with directors, but also technicians who are in their own right creators or artists so that Africa could develop its own vision and aesthetic of cinema. Voilà, donc, euh, pour ne pas être trop long, je pense qu'aujourd'hui, après 17 années, euh, nous rencontrons beaucoup de problèmes. Nous avons, bien sûr, la difficulté de trouver le financement euh, pour pouvoir accueillir les stagiaires. Parce que jusqu'à l'année dernière, euh, nous avions entièrement la formation gratuite pour nos stagiaires. Voilà. Et nous avons eu à collaborer avec certaines institutions dans certains pays comme l'Afrique du Sud ou euh, le NF. Euh, euh, la National Film and Video Foundation euh, d'Afrique du Sud a payé les billets de, au total six stagiaires qui sont venus à Ouagadougou. Voilà. Donc, euh, et nous avons aussi collaboré avec euh, d'autres institutions qui nous ont aidés à prendre en charge le séjour des stagiaires. Voilà, comme les stagiaires éthiopiens, par exemple, etc. Donc, l'idée, euh, c'était de faire en sorte que l'accès à la formation soit la plus démocratique possible. Parce qu'il est évident que beaucoup de stagiaires n'ont pas les ressources personnelles pour payer les formations. So, uh, so I don't want to go on for too long, but what I'll say is that 
today, after 17 years, we're encountering many problems. Of course, there is the issue of finding the funding necessary to welcome interns to imagine. Until last year, the training courses were entirely free. And to do this, we collaborated with various countries, such as, for instance, South Africa, where the National Film and Video Foundation bought tickets for six students to come to Ouagadougou. And we've collaborated with other institutions in other countries to enable us to bring interns to the Institute, notably Ethiopian interns, for, inter for example, because the idea was we wanted to make the access to education, to training democratic, because it's obvious that many of these potential interns do not have the resources to pay to come to the school. Voilà, et donc aujourd'hui, euh, aujourd nous sommes dans une situation où nous voulons trouver un nouveau modèle économique, mais ce modèle économique est difficile à trouver, euh, d'autant que euh, vous avez compris qu'avec euh, le COVID-19, euh, voilà, depuis 2020, nous avons du mal à trouver de nouveaux partenaires et des sponsors. Voilà, donc oui. c'est... C'est la question à laquelle nous nous confrontons aujourd'hui et je vais m'arrêter là. OK. Uh, so today we're in a situation where we need to find a new economic model. And that's very hard to find, especially as I don't need to tell you with COVID-19. Since 2020, it has been very difficult to find new partners and sponsors. So that is the question that we're facing today. And that's where I'll stop. Thank you for that, Gaston. It's a, a broad uh, piece of information that, that, that's very useful. So thank you. Thank you, Gaston. Um, Gaston is speaking from, was speaking from Ouagadougou. We're moving now to South Africa and Cape Town. And we'll be speaking to Lumela Matika. Now, South Africa has a, is, has a film history post-apartheid, which is developed and is determined to have an enduring presence with a varied range of genres in its future. And it has a distinguished international history of successful and award-winning feature and short films. And it continues to inspire new talent continually. Being based in the UK and having known a talented actor and filmmaker and African film activist, and a pioneer in Black British film, Lionel Ngakani, who lived in exile uh, and made films there for many years before returning to past post-apartheid South Africa. I cannot miss this opportunity to mention the Lionel Ngakani Foundation, which has been set up in his, in his uh, memory and to look at the legacy that he has left. So have a look for that online. But here at uh, the New York African Film Festival, we're glad to be in the presence of, um, uh, of a young woman who represents some of the contemporary talent that's being nurtured in South Africa. Lumela Matika is a South African filmmaker of promise who has made fiction, documentary and experimental work and has over 10 years experience in the South African film industry. She has a range of skills having worked as a script writer, director, producer, cinematographer, and performance artist um, uh, variously across her seven short films with a broad experience encompassing local and interna international uh, films. She received a full Barrett scholarship and completed a three-year program at Syracuse University in New York in 1919, focusing on directing. Her latest short film, Tab, has been popular on international uh, festival screens this year. So Lumela, although you're relatively early in your career and we could say that the films you've made indicate some of the ideas that inspire you most. And this festival have had the pleasure to include your latest uh, film tab in their selection. What would you say are the ideas that define and shape the films that you have made so far in your career? And what are the ideas that feed your inspiration and drive your passion to make a film? What, what, what might we see as the signifying feature in your future work? 
good question. <laughs> Loaded question. <laughs> so many hard to answer. Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm so happy to be here. So honored to be on a such a uh, a platform. I mean, with everyone on it. Uh, yeah, I'm feeling a little bit small at the moment. <laughs> no. Um, no. In terms of my work, um, I think the, let me start with the ideas that fuel my work. The ideas that fuel my work, um, I'm, a, I'm a South African Kosa woman fr um, from PE, and that is a very specific place that I come from that informs a lot of the stories that I tell. Uh, coming into the industry, I realized- PE is Port Elizabeth, right? Port Elizabeth, yes, in the Eastern Cape. And coming from, um, from South Africa and also from the continent where predominantly the, the film industry was male dominated, uh, I felt a need to kind of, uh, number one, figure out how do I as a black woman start to tell my own story. So a lot of my work is really, uh, it's, it's mostly autoethnographic work where I am working around my own experience, my own lived experience, but also the lived experience of other women around me and trying to portray that through film. Um, and in that work, I'm also thinking about, you know, uh, representation. That is a big theme that runs in my work, representation, how women are seen in film, how women are portrayed in film. Um, and that history, looking at that history of ethnography, mm -hmm. history of image making and how women have been seen over the years and trying to mm -hmm. complicate that narrative uh, through introducing you know, different narratives and narratives seen from the woman's point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and, this, and this is an ongoing project. It's seen throughout my films, both my narrative work, my documentaries, even my performance work heavily deals with this idea of the gays, representation, um, and being black and woman in the, in the industry. Right. Um, I, among the various technical roles you've explored in filmmaking, if you had to choose between them, which is the one that would be most defining for you and why? Yeah. Um, to, to, yeah, no, I, I, I think directing, directing for me is something that, but they all work in hand in hand. Uh, mm. Directing, writing and directing for me allows me to tell the story, right? right. Writing and directing allows me to start putting images up already, right? Mm -hmm. By writing it, you're already creating these images. Um, I do believe though, there is, uh, there is room for women in, in cinematography. And that is something also that interests me is that to have, to be able to, to work with the camera also allows me to, to be very specific in the images that I'm choosing. Mm -hmm and to be very um, aware of how I am maybe complicating the image in front of that lens, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm always, I'm always, I love practicing on all, on all, on all uh, disciplines. Mm -hmm. uh, performance allows a different part of my brain. Um, yeah, so it's, 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 it, it all plays a part of my practice because it all informs each other. I can perform a piece one day and then I'm writing about it the next. And then that develops into a short narrative or I am shooting something that triggers a story. So I think it's, it's I wouldn't say exactly which one I prefer over the other, but it's all something that I'm learning and growing in um, yeah, and expanding as a filmmaker and training mm. myself in different languages. Right. Well, it's very enriching to, to hear that. Um, before I move on, can I just ask you briefly to say something about how you would describe South Africa's achievements in cinema and which of those have been most significant, you think, for the country and how might, might it still improve? What would you like to see happen? South Africa has really been um, supportive, I think, in terms of young filmmakers coming out of the country. Um, as uh, Mr. Kabore said, uh, the National Film and Video Foundation has been incredibly supportive financially in funding our projects. And that's something that um, 
that's something that goes a long way, especially if it's if if it's an inter like if it's a national funding rather rather than international funding, right? Mm -hmm. um, there have been many stories that came out from South Africa in terms of the history of South Africa, and and the the work that really inspires me at the moment are the young female voices that are coming out. And I'm thinking at the moment of Upali Sashongwe, I'm thinking of Noma Wong, I'm gonna forget her surname, but she's currently screening at Sundance. Um, and these young filmmakers are, are predominantly funded by the National uh, Film and Video Foundation. I think that's important work that they're doing in terms of promoting our work and giving mm -hmm. us a platform and giving us mm -hmm. an opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm trying to also. Yeah, yeah. That's you know? fine. That's fine. It's a very young population, and it's it's inspiring what what's happening, um, you know, in South Africa and on the continent. And we look forward to seeing seeing more of that. I mean, we'll come back to some of this uh, in a while. I would just like to nip across to Los Angeles, <laughs> where where Ngozi is. Thank you, Lumela. Um, where Ngozi is, Ngozi Onwara. Um, uh, Ngozi was born in Nigeria to a Nigerian father and a white British mother, and was forced to flee with her family to escape the country's civil war. And in England, where Ngozi and her brother Simon spent the majority of their childhood, they endured much racial discrimination, which influenced many of her films. Uh, Ngozi studied at the St. Martin School of Art and the National Film and Television School and has been writing and directing her own films since 1988, uh, starting with Coffee Coloured Children and Best Wishes. She directed a number of challenging short films, often foregrounding issues important to Black women. There you go. <laughs> um, her first feature film, Welcome to the Terror Dome, won first prize at the Birmingham International Film Festival and two other festivals. And her, uh, her second feature, uh, which was made in 2006, um, Shoot the Messenger, starring a very young, I was just saying, a very young um, uh, David Oyewolo at the beginning of his career. So that's 15 years ago. Um, um, Yes, it starred, starred uh, David Oyewolo, that film. And Onwara's films, uh, Ngozi's films, have won prizes at the Berlin Film Festival, Melbourne, Toronto, and many other places. And her work has been regarded as groundbreaking within the context of Black, British, and diaspora cinema. So Ngozi, the New York Film Festival, has in the past presented a retrospective of your work. So many people here would have seen some of your films. Given your mixed um, heritage, identity and background and your experience of growing up, um, how would you identify yourself and the work that you do? How would you describe that? Here you are on a panel on African cinema. What does it mean for you and how might your work and what you do relate to the term African cinema? Good questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of how I define myself, that's a complicated question and it changes um, depending on what is expected. Um, I don't call myself an African filmmaker because I don't live and work in on the continent. And yet, um, and yet Black British doesn't feel enough because the African part of me, I mean, just a slight correction, I was born in England and then we moved over when I was an infant. So, but mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. um, but it, that's very much part of my life. It's very much part of my storytelling. It's very mm -hmm. much part of how I see the world. So Africa is in there somewhere. So and, you have, to, and you have made a couple of films. You have shot a couple of films. I've made, I've made, uh, several films there about, in, in Africa. Yeah. Yeah. Quite a, yeah. quite a few, four or five at least. Yes. And, um, and I always try within the films I'm making to make sure that they are seen in Nigeria and on the continent. Like we'll, we'll hold screen in, especially if we've shot there, but we'll, I'll always try to hold screenings there 
and it's mm -hmm. very interesting then as well the different way they are viewed in the three sort of places that I kind of work in which is Britain America and Africa within the diaspora so um I don't know do I call myself an Afro-Brit British Nigeria I do, it's up for grabs, tick what you want. Um, but it all informs my work, that African, that my, when I was a child, the sort of storytelling that I grew up with in Nigeria and the impact that that had on the way I uh, looked and what I came with, because when we came from Nigeria, I was incredibly lonely. I it was a horrible period. It was, there was a lot of racism. We were the first black family on our um, estate. We came as refugees, so we had nothing. And um, some of that comfort that I took from the stories that I had grown up with, like the idea that I had my own chi that was with me, that had come with me and was looking after me or trying to look after me. All these stories came in my head. However, when I went back to Nigeria and we went back often, I realized a lot of it was diffused. It was my lens on those, those things rather mm -hmm. than necessarily what happened there. But I still feel that's my Africa. I can still take with me what that makes it my authentic. And I think that's informed my work. So my work is um, it's, it's realism, but it's heightened realism. Mm -hmm. It's very, very vivid because those stories that I grew up were incredibly vivid. In a way, I suppose they're a bit like uh, fairy tales before Disney, you know, when really wolves really did eat children and things like that. So the stories I grew up in were vivid. And I think that really translated into my mm -hmm. work. But then I also wanted an accessibility. I wanted, I had in my mind's eye, the different people that want, were watching it. And I always wanted it to be so not so mm -hmm. arty that you couldn't show it mm -hmm. back home or wherever and people mm -hmm. relate and feel feel it. Right. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. It does okay. thank you. <laughs> I do wanted to I did want to ask you something a bit more about um, uh, your ideas and passions that in, underlie and inspire your work because um, your work combines art and activism through cinema. Would you agree? And how would you say this is expressed in your film projects? For instance, both in terms of the style and content of the film Terradome and the way film pro that film project was made, but also to some extent, you know, Shoot the Messenger. And I know that's a sort of a, a biggish question, but could you maybe just give us a few comments um, um, or the, the most um, pertinent comments in relation to that so that um, we can uh, get a sense uh, in those areas? Because I think they're quite important in terms of what you were doing. It all, it all merges. I mean, um, it is who I am. I grew up very interested in art and I grew up very mm -hmm. interested in images and I grew up very political. I couldn't help but be political. I'd arrived as a refugee and I had a mother who was disabled and we lived on a council estate. And so I grew up naturally very political and your work is an extension of who you are. And the idea that I it wouldn't find its way into my work is, is, is impossible. And then um, the idea that what, as I was sort of forming as a filmmaker, the things that used to really annoy me when I, or inspire me when I was watching films and other people's work. Firstly, we were hardly ever there. And then the way we were there. And then, you know, if there was a black person and a white person on the screen, it would be lit for the white person and the black person could just figure out which bit of light they could get when it went. So there was an aesthetic that I always wanted to, to get in my work, which was that, you know, because also there was a lot of low budget filmmaking and this idea that you could just, you know, for black, black was gritty work and you just sort of got a camera and went and shot it rather than it necessarily having aesthetics and, um, and production values that you could want to go for. So I was always very um, driven by the idea to make images 
that told a story and valued our aesthetic within, within the frame. So we used to spend, you know, a lot of time lighting people, even within documentary settings, which maybe wasn't, you know. Um, so that was incredibly uh, important. And then the idea um, of storytelling not necessarily being linear, like having a rhythm and maybe bouncing, that came from the way uh, both the oratory of Africa, but also like hip hop and these sort of influences that converged mm -hmm. that I thought could find their own place mm. within the work but also you just mm. have to remember as a filmmaker you work very instinctively you work with yes. your own sort yes. of set of yes. tools so for me yes you know having a certain image having a, it, it wasn't I can theorize about it a bit afterwards but mm. at the time it was mm -hmm. uh, what I want what I want to see and then also what had been absent so mm -hmm. you know the absence of black women in particular it wasn't that I felt I was being a woman filmmaker. I was just mm. being me and I wanted to see this mm. and this is how this happened. Uh, it's very organic. It kind of, mm -hmm. I can be intellectual afterwards, but at the time mm -hmm. it's just work in the way you were. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, well, we can maybe come back a bit later to another way in which um, your work is aren't activist and that's to do with how Terradome was actually made, you know, at that time, it was a quite important thing, but we'll come back to that because I'd like to get to, uh, Amjad, here he is. <laughs> you had a nap, right? <laughs> <laughs> so Amjad, um, I'd like to say a few words by way of background um, in this area. The, the cinema of Sudan, and Amjad is actually speaking from Cairo, right? At the moment, you're, you're in Cairo. Okay. Um, the cinema of Sudan, he's, he's a Sudanese filmmaker. He's known as a Sudanese filmmaker, has a long and established history of predominantly non-fiction films from the era of the pioneer of Sudanese cinema, Gadala Gubara, who made scores of documentaries and three feature films and was regarded as one of the pioneers of African cinema. And it said, who it said in 1955, produced Africa's first uh, color film, the short film Song of Khartoum. Maybe that's, that's uh... for decades, he flew the flag for Sudanese, for Sudan regarding cinema on the continent. And in recent years, we've seen some great achievements following in his footsteps. Uh, for example, the engaging documentary Khartoum of Side by the young female director Marwa Zain, which won the best documentary prize at the Tarifa Tangier African uh, Film Festival in 2019, and the humorous and a personal favorite of mine at the IDFA Festival in Amsterdam was Talking About Trees. Wonderful film uh, <laughs> made in uh, 2019 by Suhaib. Uh, Gas Melbari about a film group that refuses to see cinema in Sudan as a thing of the past. But as you will have seen in this festival, mm -hmm. Sudan is very much alive with the stunning award-winning <clears throat> film, You Will Die at 20, which is the seventh narrative feature in the country's cinema history and which won the prestigious um, Lion of the Future Award at the Venice Film Festival. And that is Ahmad Abu Al Alal, oh, sorry, Alala, um, <laughs> who is a S Sudanese filmmaker and producer born in and is currently residing in the UAE. Uh, he studied media at the Emirates University and he's worked as a director in television. He's produced and directed seven short films, including Studio in 2012, which was supervised during a workshop uh, conducted by the distinguished Iranian filmmaker Abbas Karis Karistami. He won the best Arabic play award for, um, uh, from the Arab, author Arab authority for uh, his short film, Apple Pies. And he currently leads the programming committee in the Sudan Independent Film Festival and is Sudan's representative at the Arab Film Institute. 
You Will Die at 20 is his first feature film and very, very good achievement that is too. So Ahmad, Amjad, sorry, I've got <laughs> a, a few questions for you, but um, because we'll, we'll be um, coming back to you as well. Um, given the distinguished film history in early Sudanese cinema and the long gaps in between feature films being made in the country and consequently the gap also in Sudanese people having the opportunity uh, to see their own cinema. Could you tell us please about the pressure and the importance and what it means to you to break, to get to break that feature screen silence in Sudan with this film that has been dubbed the rebirth of Sudanese cinema. Um, um, how do you choose the subject that will, that will carry such a major responsibility? Well, thank you, Giovanni, for the introduction. And thanks for the, all, all the speakers. I really enjoyed your um, experience and your story about how, how filmmakers in Africa could be, because uh, that's really inspiring um, for me. And another filmmakers in Sudan, they want to be a filmmaker. They want to go out. So I was one of them. I I was just, um, I was programming film festivals, um, like, okay, so I've been film festivals, and before that, Dubai Film Festival since 2007. Uh, and I would just like, I think it started with me with jealousy. I just, I feel jealous, you know? I just feel like why all those films came from countries they also don't have that um, infrastructure for cinema, and why we can, why we can't try that in Sudan? Well, I tried uh, since two thousand five. I made my short film in Sudan, and, I, and and there I discovered why it's difficult. I discovered because the politi uh, the, the politics will play a role. I discover because when you know uh, the Islamic regime, Al Bashir and his group, when they just um, they came in 1989 and they decided uh, this is Islamic authority and no cinema anymore. They closed all the cinemas in Sudan and, uh, and they closed the, uh, the situation of cinema in Sudan. And maybe talking about, talking about trees, the, the documentary film is talking about that in particular with the directors, they stopped uh, during doing their films. Uh, Ibrahim Shaddad and uh, Tayyip Mahdi and all those guys. And uh, and by coincidence, the film, uh, the, talking about Riz, it was in February and our feature film was in September in Venice, that was in Berlin Ali. And so it was like telling the world what's going on in Sudan and then telling like, you know what, we can fight and we can do something. And that was in September. You know, with the old die twenty in Venice, um, and by coincidence, we took three years or four years. Like Suhaib took four years for me, I took three years, and Marwa also she took four years doing those mm -hmm. films without really knowing like we are doing this. Maybe I know Marwa because she was she, she's supposed to be assistant director in my film, and then she got engaged in her, in her so we can't do that. Uh, but she she was with me in scouting even. You know, but for Suhail, I didn't know like he's doing about Sudanese cinema is not there because of blah blah blah. You know, and then we were like executing that by doing a feature film. You know, so it was a coincidence with the revolution with everything in 2019. I started shooting the film uh, in 2018 in December, 17th December, and actually that was the same day of the revolution. By coincidence, also I was shooting in a village, three hours down of Khartoum, and the revolution started same day in Khartoum, 17th December. It was like, I don't know, is that coincidence, destiny, the universe? I don't know what is that, but it was so amazing. Mm. I mean, amazing the feeling, a month of shooting, we came back every day to the hotel, me and the crew, Sudanese, you know, very, most of them activists, but I kept, I, I, I captive them with me in the film. Mm -hmm. They can be part of the streets. And even the French people, they were like, just came back from France, from Paris, from the Yellow Suits uh, Revolution, mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, like mm -hmm. the movement. So right. everything was revolutionary uh, inside mm -hmm. that set or inside mm -hmm. that hotel. 
And uh, it continues that way. It continues yes. till we finished shooting and till I was editing and then I heard about the, the sit-in and I stopped editing mm -hmm. after, actually I would say that for the first time, uh, can they love the film? They love draft five. And yes, I should yes. supposed to work and continue the film. Yeah. And I stopped it to go back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I suppose what, what I was asking as well is about the significance of the subject that you chose for to make this film um, at the time that that Sudan was in, you know, it was something that was going to be very significant for Sudan to return mm. to a feature film and to um, you know, people to be able to view these in the cinema, how how that relates to the subject that you chose to do, the, the, the film that you uh, chose to do. Well, when 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 I was when I chose the story, it's a short story by mm. a uh, novelist Hamur Ziada. I never th say I want to do a film because it's a, a call for a revolution. I never mm. say that. But I believe the revolution in Sudan it wasn't in 2018. It was since since Sudan became two Sudans. Since we separated from South mm. Sudan, I think that's the time when everything changed. And every movement of artists in Sudan it became seeking of freedom in Sudan. Right. So 2010, and we had like big movement in 2013, and we lost 250 of our friends there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I think the revolution was by default part of us. So by default, it may affected the, the, the story that I chose. Mm -hmm. That story will die 20, that it's talking about, you know, prophecy and stuff, but actually it's talking about telling the main character, you need to open that box and go out. Mm -hmm. And by coincidence, we showed that that scene, I remember in 15th January, the four Muslims running on the street at the end of the film, and we came back to the hotel and it was the first day when people go, went out on the street running. I mean, that was... Coincidence or not, I don't know. I don't know. I can't. I can't. Maybe the history will say that. I I right. can't say it right now. Maybe me after ten right. years, I can really decide okay. what what it was. Um, but yeah, I think we just we were yeah. like captive by the idea of freedom, so that affected mm. it somehow choosing right. the story. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. I will come back to you in a while if we have an opportunity to talk a bit about um, Sudan's role on the African continent and also in relation to Egypt. There's something that, that I always hear, this, this back and forth between Sudan and Egypt and especially around cinema, which I'd yeah. love to hear, but I'm aware that we, are, we started late and we're running late. And yeah. um, we, have, we do have a few questions for, for q and I don't know if mm. we're able to carry on a bit longer, so. Maybe Davika can tell us if we can um, continue on and and maybe maybe you'll ask one or two questions and then see, see yeah, where I we think, are. I, I, th I, think, I, think, I think Giovanni, I can answer just very fast the, the uh -huh. relation between Sudan and Egypt. For Sudan, Sudan and Egypt, history-wise, it was one. Cinema. Yeah. You know, it was one. We shared the Faro's uh, uh, history. And, and by the way, this is my next project that Pharaohs, I'm preparing. The Pharaohs, the Pharaohs. Yes, the Pharaohs. Wow the kings of Sudan, the black African kings, you know? Right. And right. Uh, I'm working on that right now. So mm -hmm. I think the relation, it's there somehow. Mm -hmm. Also mm -hmm. the, the, the mutual Arab culture. So Sudanese, mm -hmm. they, they have the, that African roots, African culture mm -hmm. also, but actually mm -hmm. with Islam, with many things, the Arab culture is more, and actually because the relation with Egypt, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. why the Arab culture is more. The cinema of, of Egypt, as you said in your introduction, it had effect on the on North Africa and actually definitely in Sudan, you know. Right. Personally, my mother, she's Egyptian, <laughs> you know. She's half Personally, Egyptian. Personally, what? Yeah, oh, your mother is my Egyptian. mother half Egyptian. South yeah. Egypt, she's Egyptian. Mm. So, mm. you know, I share that mm. and somehow that's why you find sometimes uh, like Egyptian songs on my film or Egyptian films on my film. Yes, yeah. yes, okay. Um, mm. And a, a bit about um, Sudan in relation to cinema on the continent generally. I mean, yeah. um, you know, that, that's another 
dimension because it is it has this this you know separated history from the very early right. time to like now and nothing in between so where does it fit in terms of well cinema so that is between so that is between Japan. so that is between and it's supposed to be um in touch with here and in touch with up with you know with them mm -hmm. I mean, but so far, I'm, I really was disappointed because my film is, does it, it really doesn't, my film, and so hype's film, and even Marwa's film. We didn't mm -hmm. really screen our films in Africa. You know why? Very simple. I just, I didn't find a film distributor. Mm -hmm. I like one or two, we talk to them, they don't feel like it's selling Africa. My mm -hmm. film, you will die 20. Okay. So, okay. and actually it stays in Egypt for seven months. So I didn't know mm -hmm. where the problem is, but I just, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't find uh, mm -hmm. African distributor, so it never shows in Africa. And actually, mm -hmm. it was in Netflix Middle East, but not not in Netflix Africa. So mm -hmm. I think this is what really we need to talk about it maybe in another discussion. Netflix What's Africa. going on in distributing <laughs> there in Africa? Yes, yes, yeah. definitely. That's a, another big question. Um, uh, I, I'm looking at, we've got a couple of questions. There's one for Gaston from Akin is, uh, and he thanks, first of all, all of the participants for presenting these ex exciting perspectives. And he says, um, uh, Gaston is curious um, about your point uh, regarding a new business model for African cinema. And while it can be said that Nollywood has provided something of an answer, it's the case that the cooperative model that African filmmakers contemplated in the final section of Camera d'Afrique, the film Camera d'Afrique may still be viable. And that model is at work in a sense in the way the New York African film festivals um, evolved and continues to operate. My question to Ga Gaston and other participants is what happened to those ideas of cooperation as a, as, a, as a model, sorry. Ben, euh, je peux dire que c'est hélas euh, ce qui arrive souvent aux grandes idées, aux visions et aux convictions. Euh, C'est-à-dire que la réalité sur le terrain euh, se présente de façon très contraignante et tout ce que les cinéastes ont développé comme idée à propos de la coproduction, à propos euh, de, de, du financement du film euh, par les États, parce que nous avons besoin des États pour organiser notre cinéma. S'il n'y a pas d'organisation, s'il n'y a pas de politique de développement du cinéma, ben, les cinéastes tout seuls ne peuvent pas tout faire. So sadly, what I can say is that it's sadly what happens often to big ideas, to visions and convictions, which is that the reality on the ground is extremely constraining. Um, filmmakers' ideas of co-production, of funding from the state, we need the state's help to organize cinema. If there's no organization and policy of filmmaking, then filmmakers are on their own. Parce qu'il faut que des conditions favorables euh, au développement du cinéma dans tous ces compartiments euh, puissent exister. Par exemple, aujourd'hui, euh, nous continuons de demander la mise en place de fonds pour le financement du cinéma même dans des pays développés comme la France, l'Allemagne ou l'Angleterre, il y a des fonds publics qui existent pour aider à la création cinématographique, pour aider à la production des films, pour aider à la promotion des films, etc. Voilà, malheureusement, les cinéastes ne sont pas entendus et peut-être que aussi, on pense qu'il y a d'autres priorités plus important que le cinéma, mais qu'est-ce qui peut être plus important que la culture dans son ensemble 
c'est tout commence par la culture et se termine par la culture dans le développement d'un pays ou d'un continent. Okay. Oh, he's going to translate. <laughs> There needs to be conditions favorable to the development of cinema in all its aspects. This has to exist. So we continue to ask for funds to be put in place to develop cinema, the way that countries in the developed world, France, Germany, the UK, have these funding bodies that exist to help with the production and the promotion of cinema. But unfortunately, we filmmakers are not heard when we make these demands. Maybe people think that there are other more important priorities than cinema, but what could be more important than culture? We begin and end with culture in what is important for developing a country and a continent. Alors, une dernière petite chose. Okay. Vous voyez le Burkina Faso, qui est un petit pays très enclavé, qui n'a pas de grandes ressources, a pu mettre en place une politique du cinéma dans les années 70, 80, 90. Et puis, il y a eu le FMI qui est arrivé, qui a... Euh, exiger euh, une autre manière de considérer la culture juste comme un business à, au même titre que les autres secteurs et notre cinéma a commencé à plonger. Heureusement que le gouvernement, les gouvernements qui se sont succédés ont compris l'importance du festival panafricain du cinéma de Ouagadougou et, et ont fait de leur mieux pour que ce festival, qui a eu 50 ans euh, en 2019, continue d'exister et soit, en quelque sorte, un pôle d'attraction de tous les créateurs du cinéma africain et de la diaspora. Je pense que c'est important que ce festival continue de rester un lieu de rencontre des cinéastes de notre continent et de la diaspora, mais garde aussi sa vision des premiers pionniers de Semben Ousmane, qui pense aussi que c'est un instrument politique de libération de l'Afrique. D'aucuns diront, mais les pays africains sont indépendants depuis 50-60 ans, mais la libération est quelque chose qui est continu, c'est-à-dire c'est pouvoir avoir entre ses mains les clés de son développement. Et cela passe aussi par la transformation des mentalités, par la construction et le développement d'une résilience à la fois nationale et continentale. Et le cinéma peut apporter beaucoup dans tout cela. Et les témoignages de mes collègues qui ont parlé montrent bien que le cinéma est un miroir important qui aide les gens à se réapproprier leur réalité et à être capable d'être eux-mêmes les personnes qui vont définir leur destin. Ça, moi, je crois beaucoup en cette capacité du cinéma de construire et développer les perceptions et les consciences pour une sorte d'appropriation de soi dans tous les sens. So, take the example of Burkina Faso, which is a small country, landlocked with minimal resources. Well, in the 1990s, we were able to put in place a, a healthy funding system for cinema. But then the IMF came along and demanded that culture be considered the same as any business. And our cinema took an, a nosedive because of that. Luckily, the governments that followed in Burkina Faso, successive governments understood the importance of the Pan-African Film Festival of Ouagadougou, which has existed for 50 years and still exists to this day. This is a festival that draws creators from all over Africa, 
and the diaspora to discuss and think about cinema, um, it's very important that this festival remains not only as a meeting place for creators from all over Africa and the diaspora, but also that it keep alive the vision that the founding father Usman Semben had, which is of cinema and the festival as a political tool for the liberation of Africa. Now, some people will tell you, well, African countries have been independent for 50 or 60 years, but liberation is something that continues. It's one of the keys to development is through the transformation of minds, through the development of resilience, both on a national and a continental level. And I believe that cinema contributes very strongly to that. As my colleagues on this panel have shown, uh, they have shown that cinema is an important mirror for people to reappropriate their reality and in a sense, define their fate. I'm a strong believer in this idea that cinema builds and develops consciousness in a way that allows us to appropriate ourselves. Uh, well, that's very full and always a very um, insightful response, Gaston. Thank you for that. And I could see the other panelists were nodding, they're in agreement. So I can see that, that um, you know, that there are a lot of, there's a lot of agreement in terms of what you said. I don't know if anybody wants to add anything to that, but we do have some other questions which we can go on to, but if anyone was particularly inspired to, to add anything, we can do that as well. I, I just, I, I was really noticing when, when Mr. Gaston was talking about starting a public fund. Mm -hmm. Well, that's my dream in Sudan to start a public fund. Do you believe, like I made, you will die at 20, and I will say the number, $700,000, wow. not a penny from Sudan. And that's wow. really make me sad. Wow. And, and, and really what I'm trying to achieve now is doing what you did. And uh, I hope, I hope what you did, guys. Like, I, I do actually new government after revolution with a problem with money, definitely, but at least um, was believing in art and cinema, at least, you know. So I'm trying with that. Believing in ourselves. Just one little, I do have a, a question waiting for Lumela. But in terms of what you just said, I just wanted to go back to, um, to Ngozi because believing in themselves and to make mm. a film was very much the, the model that they chose to make their first feature. And when I spoke about art and activism, I mean, the way of, of actually approaching that project was, was also this, this whole idea of believing in yourself when you know, there wasn't uh, support for certain types of cinema being made. Um, do you want to just add something small to, to that, to what was yeah, being I mean, said. The whole idea behind Terror Dome, it really was guerrilla filmmaking. It was like a complete sort of just surge that we wanted to make it, it wasn't there. And if we couldn't get the money to make it from other places, we would do it. So it was crowdfunded before crowdfunding even um, started. And it was very community-based. People, a lot, like, it was almost like you had to pay to be in it. People, everybody contributed something we had all, we did, we, we did lots of, um, the idea of it being independent, of it being ours. Now, you know, if somebody had written us a check and said, here, go make it, that would have been great. Yes, yeah? so I'm not gonna say that this is what was our first choice of doing it, but the alternative of not doing it, yeah, was not acceptable. So it was this um, complete kind of grassroots, we will make this, this happen. By any means necessary. <laughs> by any means necessary. <laughs> Definitely. I think you used that as a slogan at one time in the fundraising as well. So, yeah. yeah. Can, I, can I say a few Sorry. words? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. I, I shall try to tell it directly. To, quick, quickly. <laughs> Nicolas, so. uh, I, want, I just want to say that, in fact, if you, you see, you know, the past, you can understand that the filmmakers of all over the parts in Africa and those who are living outside Africa are 
fought their best to make films. Some of them have uh, lost the, the ownership of their land and house in order to get money to make films. So in the past, all the filmmakers have done what was their duty. But in fact, this kind of making films is important because it's a kind of self, you know, uh, recovering of ourselves. But if we need to make films that could go on the market and compete, that could bring back money in order to produce other films, we have also to envisage that we need other mechanisms of funding for cinema. Right, definitely, definitely to, to be able to continue. I mean, this whole guerrilla, guerrilla filmmaking or making films for different platforms is what a lot of young people out of sheer frustration and, and you know, uh, determination to do something and to express something are doing and it happens with each generation. So, but we need, we need, definitely need things to, that, that will actually serve in a much more structured and long-term way, the cinema, cinema of the continent as well. Um, thanks to you for your patience, Lumela. <laughs> There's been, a, there was a question for Lumela. Sorry, for Giovanni, Lumela. Giovanni, sorry, I just yeah. want to say like, really thank you and I need to oh, run for to another go. meeting. Oh, yeah. okay. So oh, really I was enjoying you. this and I hope we can do this all, all the time, talking oh. African filmmakers together. I hope to meet you again and thank you very sure. much for your wonderful film. Thank you. Thank you, Anja. Thank, thank you, you guys. for joining thank us. You all. Thank before you for you go, us. Before you go, I just want well, to yeah. say... I, I saw your film I saw your film a couple of weeks ago um, and it blew me away it was just um, oh. it was just a brilliant moving really spe like un you, you didn't know what was happening it was it was great it was fantastic oh, well thank you well, thank you stunning, that's stunning. really nice to hear stunning. thank you guys thank you thank you, Bye. Well. Thank you for joining Enjoy. us sorry Lumela um, do you find tension between wanting to create feel freely as an artist outside of your race and identity and the responsibility of representing black and African women on film? <laughs> um, no, it just reminded me of shoot the messenger. <laughs> Sorry, carry on. Yes. I think I, I'll answer it in two parts. I think the first part is, no, I don't find tension. Um, and the reason why I don't find tension is because there's something very liberating that film gives me, you know, film gives me a voice. Film gives me a voice, not just for myself, but for my community. Mm -hmm. And I also think that the second part is, I ask myself a lot, what is the responsibility uh, as a filmmaker? Mm -hmm. You know, my responsibility as a filmmaker is to serve my community, is to build my community and is to make films that first engages them and my identity comes part and parcel as who I am. And I live in a society with these laws that says that I'm black, I'm female, and, and that the oppressions that come with being that. Um, so yeah, so in, in two folds, it's just the freedom that it gives me and the responsibility that I have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that, Lumela. Has COVID influenced work? Let's end with that one. <laughs> if anyone has anything to to speak about, to say about that? Has COVID influenced work? Influenced the whole world. I mean, it's like, it's, <laughs> what can you say? <laughs> but I just wanted to say something about the, the future of African, what the future of African mm -hmm. cinema looks like. And um, so I'm in America and the last couple of weeks, it's been the, um, the, the viewing for the Academy Award um, International Films. And I've been watching them and it's just been magical. It's been like, so there was the Sudanese that was Amit's film that was just fantastic. And then there was Night of Kings, King, Night of Kings, is that what it's called? And um, The Burial and The Milkmaid oh. and The Left. Yeah. It was just, I just sat there and it felt, oh my God, Africa <laughs> cinema 
is taking over the world. It was just like, it was a range of different stories. They were so well done. They were so beautiful. The sound, because sometimes, you know, you watch a film, everything, the technical things were all there. It felt like they had, because when, when I was coming up, there was a lot of fil African films made with French money. And it had, mm -hmm. they had a sort of very kind of uh, African view, yeah, view of Africa. You could still see, the French gaze as well, even though, whereas these films felt very much that the directors were making their films and their stories Amen. and technically it was fantastic. So that's just as somebody sitting outside of the continent watching it. It was, um, it feels we're really, really on track at the moment. Magical. And it's so ex 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 exciting. Magical. I, I feel exactly the same way because there's, there's a lot of great work coming through, a lot of new talent, and they are, you know, just burning up the screens. And it's wonderful. Yeah. It's wonderful. Right. Um, Lumela, Gaston, any last word or any y response? Yes, I, I wanted to say, again, Nicolas, excuse me, but uh, the time is short, so I want to make us save time. Uh, what I would like to underline is that despite of all the problems we have, we can see that there are new talents coming like waves every five years, every two years. So there is a real need, a vital need of our own images and nobody can stop that. Yes. It would be delayed because of the constraints, but I mean, we are not begging to anyone the authorization to tell stories, to tell our own stories. Mm -hmm. But I think there are people inside our countries, inside the continent, that should be aware that cinema has to be supported. We need film halls. All of them have closed. Cinema, cinemas, cinema halls. Cinema halls, cinema halls, you know, the theaters. You know, this is something that we need because our audiences are starting to see, to see the images of African filmmakers. Mm. So I, I mean, we are not just, uh, you know, crying or complaining all the time. We are doing things. And I think that, we should testify that the filmmakers most of the time have done their part despite of all the obstacles, some, but some other decision makers have to play their role. To yes. Thank you, thank you, Gaston. Lumela, anything? Nothing in particular. I think COVID, in terms of how COVID has influenced the way I work, I, I work lighter. Mm -hmm. You know, I pick up my phone, I tell smaller stories with my phone, and I try and keep working. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's shown us that we can even work on like a very minimal scale, and we can create mm -hmm. powerful stories, and it's all about stories. And, and I, it's very difficult to follow Gaston, but I mean, it's, it's, it's all about creating, 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 and independent cinema mm -hmm. is also an option. Independent mm -hmm. cinema allows us independent voice. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I, I, that's what I learned from COVID, creating mm -hmm. uh, more often and on a very small scale. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all for that. Uh, thank you, Nicholas, for your translation. But thank you, Gaston, for Merci being Nicola. being <laughs> for being um, being here and for your for your contribution, Lumela. Thank you again. Um, wonderful to meet you, and I'm glad you were able to join us too. And my sister Ngozi, it's so great to see you. I don't know why we don't do this more often, <laughs> you know, directly. But um, thank you, and thank you to uh, films film at Lincoln Center and to the New York African Film Festival. Thank you all and to all of you who were here uh, listening and watching this. So thanks very much and until the next time. Thank you. <laughs>